you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
all the children. Uh, during the procession, after this reading, all children are normally invited to come down to the parish hall for an Easter egg hunt and celebration. And we're asking parents to come down there to get the children at communion time because we have a lot of activities for them. So um, they'll follow the little cross during the procession and after this, and then you can get them for communion. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Colossians. Since you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden in Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. The word of the Lord.
for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise, rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father. To my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. you pray with me? We thank you, O oh God, for the gift of your love. And we offer and present to you, so far as we are able, all that we are, all that we have, and all that we do, as only an emptiness to be filled by you until you are all in all, and we are complete. We pray to the one who is the very fullness of your love. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Each of us has our own favorite version of the gospel. You know, of course, that John Dominic Crossan says that there's only one gospel, but we have four according to, according to Matthew, and according to Mark, and according to Luke, and according to John. I've always loved Luke the most, I think because he's the loving physician with a soft spot in his heart for people who are sick, with a soft spot for widows and orphans and the poor. And the musician loves Luke, the musician in me loves Luke, because he's the one with all the songs in the beginning of his gospel. The gospel according to Luke is sort of like a Broadway musical at the beginning, you know? These two people come together and they meet and they burst into a song. And then two other people meet, and they burst into a song. And over and over it goes, I just wish somebody would make a Broadway musical out of the first part of Luke, because it's already set up for it. Part of the way through Luke, he sort of gets rid of the songs, but at the beginning, they're just fabulous. And the lawyer in me loves Matthew, because Matthew is the one who is interested in portraying Jesus as the fulfillment of the law of Moses. And if there was a part of me that is brief, that loves brevity, it would love Mark, being the first of the gospel writers. He was also the one who started the gospel writing business for the world. There was no gospel until Mark came along. It was it's great. He's the Joe Friday of the gospel writers. If you remember the old Dragnet show, just the facts, man, just the facts. In Mark, Jesus is born 29 years old and working. No Bethlehem, none of that stuff, you know. He's already 29 and he's working just the way all kids should be born. <laughs> of the four versions of the gospel, John is always the odd man out. He's always a little different than the other three. 
John has no parables at all, and the, the storyteller in me doesn't like the omission of the parables. John doesn't have a birth narrative in Jerusalem. There are no songs or canticles in John. John is the theologian of the crowd. He's the one that is interested in what does it all mean? Not so much what happened, but what does it mean? But when it comes to life and death, John shines in his gospel. Every one of the suggested gospel lessons for funeral services in our prayer book comes from John because he's so good at life and death. And his story of the resurrection that we have today glistens with relationships. It glistens with the tears and desperation of Mary Magdalene being transformed into joy when she discovers that the person she thought was the gardener is actually Jesus risen from the dead. None of the other gospel stories have such a wonderful personal account of the resurrection as John. John talks about what it means for Peter, what it means for John, the beloved disciple, what it means for Mary. It's fabulous. So let's take a look. Our story begins, John says, the first day of the week. The same day that God began creation, God is making a new creation in the resurrection. Unlike the other three resurrection stories in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John doesn't say it's the third day after Jesus' death, but rather John says it's the first day of the week. This is our little clue right off the bat that God is doing something remarkably new and amazingly creative on this day. Notice that unlike the other Gospels, in John, Mary Magdalene doesn't come to the tomb at daybreak. She comes to the tomb before day, while it's still dark. And in John, you remember from our passage about Nicodemus a few weeks back, darkness represents spiritual darkness as well as physical darkness. It means being in the dark, as it were. Nicodemus is in the dark when he comes to Jesus, and Mary Magdalene, when she comes to the tomb, she's in the dark. She has no idea what's going on. When Mary sees the stone rolled away, she panics in her unbelief. Being in the dark, she immediately assumes that the same people who killed her beloved Jesus had also stolen his body. And she runs away from the tomb to go get Peter, the disciple who is the rock, the authority for the new church, and John, the beloved disciple, whom Jesus loved in a special and remarkable way. Remember, John is the disciple that Jesus entrusts the care of his mother to when he says, here is your mother, woman, here is your new son. So there was a special, almost brother-like relationship between John and Jesus. Anyhow, when she finds Peter and, and John, she tells him, they, Notice that pronoun, they have taken away the Lord, and we do not know where they have laid it. Being in the dark, she immediately assumes that it's us versus them, the believers versus the persecutors. She retreats into binary thinking, us or them, good or bad, black or white, all or nothing, either or kind of thinking. She accuses the disembodied and depersonalized powers of evil, the thems of the world, of stealing the corpse as the ultimate insult to Jesus. She immediately goes into us versus them dualistic thinking, black or white, good or evil, us or them. It's a land with no creativity on the day when God is full of creativity on the day of the resurrection. So Mary is in the dark, as it were, about what God is up to. Since Peter and John are also in, the, also in the dark, they take off running as well. John being younger, I mean, I'm old like Peter and my back hurts and my hips hurt and my knees hurt, so 
John's going to beat me to the tomb, you know. Uh, so John reaches the tomb first because he's young and he's in better shape. Uh, and maybe it's even because John has this intense love for Jesus that compels him to get to the tomb as fast as he can. But anyhow, even though he gets to the tomb first, out of respect for the authority entrusted to Peter, the younger John waits for Peter to get there to go in. John sees the linen cloth lying there. That's the first clue. If the powers of evil had stolen the body, they wouldn't have bothered to unwrap it, you know? Crooks are not neat, you know? <laughs> Thieves do not tidy up your house after they steal stuff in it. That doesn't happen. So Peter goes in and sees the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, neatly folded or rolled up, put separate from the cloth that had wrapped his body. Thieves and terrorists do not do things like that, you know? Criminals don't fold your laundry after they rot your house. And we're told that John goes into the tomb and immediately he sees and believes. Like all of us believers in later generations, John believed without seeing the resurrected Jesus. We don't know exactly what John believed, but we're told that he believed. Notice how Jesus' resurrection is different from Lazarus being raised from the dead, which happened a few chapters earlier in John and a few weeks ago in our lesson. When Lazarus came out of the tomb, the people who were there had to unbind him from his wrappings and set him free. When Jesus comes forth from the tomb, he is already unbound. He's already set free. As Francis Maloney writes, not only is the tomb empty, but the trappings of death are also empty. And then we're told that Peter and John go home. We're not told why they went home or what they did after they got there. I can understand that maybe Peter went home trying to figure out what was going on, but we're told that John believed already. So why would he go home instead of sharing his faith in the resurrection? Who knows? It's on my list of questions to ask when I get there. I hope you all have a list of questions to ask when you get there because I've got a pile of them. And I hope you are making your list. Here our story shifts to a singular focus on Mary Magdalene, who is still weeping outside the tomb. She's still in the dark, in the place of unbelief. She looks in the tomb and she sees two angels in white who ask her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she repeats her deepest fear and unbelief that the disembodied, dualistic powers of evil, all the days of this world that seem to do everything that's horrible, have taken her Lord away, stolen the body, and she doesn't know where they have taken it. She turns around and sees Jesus, whom she thinks is the gardener, because she's still in the dark, as it were. He asks her the exact same question, why are, we, are you weeping? Whom do you see? Ironically, you see this amazing irony that John paints for us? Ironically, the person that she's looking for is the very person she's at, that, who is asking her who she's looking for. It's amazing irony. And just as ironically, it's almost the same question that Jesus asked Andrew, another disciple, at the very beginning of the gospel. Whom do you see? You know, we have these themes that roll over. Mary's journey into the darkness and grief and desperation goes one step further. She thinks the gardener might be the one who had stolen the body. She thinks the gardener may be working for the evil, malevolent, violent them who are behind the theft of Jesus' body. And she makes the clearly impossible offer to take the body off his hands, even though she, as a single woman, would not have the ability to carry all that dead weight. She says, just tell me what you've done with him, and I will take care of it. She makes this clearly impossible offer out of desperation, panic, overwhelming love and grief. 
You know, when you're desperate, you promise crazy things. You do. We all do. And just like the good shepherd who is in that window over my shoulder knows each of his sheep by name, Jesus speaks her name, Mary, or in Greek, Miriam. And like the sheep who know the shepherd's voice, Mary replies, Rabboni, my teacher, my master, the fear, the darkness of disbelief disappeared in the light of the resurrection. Rabboni is Mary's confession of her faith. She believes and is no longer in the dark. So she tries, like we all would do, to capture that Kodak moment. They used to call them Kodak moments, you know? She tries to preserve that moment. It's a natural tendency when you think that somebody you love is lost forever and you discover that there they are, safe and sound. It's a natural tendency just to cling on to them, you know? and savor that Kodak moment. And it's also almost always a, a, a mistake to try to cling to the past instead of embracing the future and moving forward to the future. For Jesus has work to do, and he's got work for Mary to do. The ironic thing is that Mary could not understand the message of the angels in the tomb, and yet, after she believed, she becomes the messenger. The word angel means messenger, by the way. She becomes the angel to the other disciples. Jesus sends her to tell them that she has seen the Lord and he has said those things to her. She tells her that they have a new relationship with God, who is both Jesus' father and their father. John's emotional and tender account of the resurrection has got to be one of the most intimate and personal things in all of Scripture, and certainly in the four according tos. It conveys the deep darkness of gloom and doubt and fear and sadness, and how all that fear and sadness and doubt disappear in the light of the resurrection. And once the doubt and fear disappear, Mary gets to be the angel, the messenger to the other disciples. When you think about it, she is the evangelist, the person with good news, taking the good news to the people who are going to become the evangelists to the world. She is the one who brings the good news. She is sent by Jesus. That's what apostle means, the one who is sent. So Mary is the apostle to the apostles. She is sent to the ones who who are going to be sent out into the world. Thus, the message of the resurrection was first entrusted to a woman. Remember that always. Mary Magdalene, in the days when women were not allowed to be witnesses in court, the Lord entrusted Mary to be the first witness to the resurrection as a sign that, as Peter says in our first lesson today, with God there is no partiality. As St. Paul's, this lovely parish that I've grown to love, goes whirling through its transition process for a new rector, there are a lot of unanswered questions, you know? You know, the congregation is kind of like Mary at the tomb. You're in the dark about your new rector. You don't know who the Reverend Candace is. You don't know if she squeezes the toothpaste in the middle of the tube yet. <laughs> no. She doesn't know who you are yet. You probably have some fear of being in the dark surrounding that future. What will your new rector be like? How are things going to be different after she gets here? We just don't know what awaits after we leave the tomb. But the one thing we do know is that Jesus is still raised from the dead. He still speaks our name in the cool early morning in the garden. And as soon as he speaks our names, all the fear and doubt that we carry with us will vanish into the light of the resurrection. Just like God began the new creation on that first Easter morning with the resurrection, God is continually in the recreating and resurrecting business. And we can all go forth 
and to the light of a new day, knowing that wherever we go, Jesus is with us always, always and forever preparing a new place and a new life for us, even to the end of the ages. For alleluia, Christ is risen, the Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. and enjoy the words of the night. you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever, remembering especially this day, Frank, Evelyn, Robert, Janice, and Florence. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom.
Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins. No, no, and unknown. They have done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in the newness of life. and welcome to this Easter. I hope you've all had a wonderful Easter morning so far and will continue to have a wonderful Easter day. Through the rest of the day, remember that Easter is 50 days long. It doesn't end until the day of Pentecost. So, uh, you know, I guess that makes room for another 49 Easter baskets. <laughs> so, uh, I hope you enjoy all the, the joys of Easter and the return of whatever study on Wednesday at 1030 and sort of a, a usual sort of uh, back to normal this week. Uh, are there any other announcements, Joe? Uh, or um, on the 30th of April will be our last day with our beloved Father Ed. And so we are going to have a celebration in his honor. Of, we're going to have Texas barbecue and all the trimmings and celebrate everything that we love about this beautiful man and his ministry. And then the following Sunday after that, we are going to be welcoming uh, Reverend Burgess and uh, with a potluck afterwards. So bring your favorite dish and get to know her a little bit better and let her get to know you. Thank you. And on my last day, you can either sing me Happy Trails to Use. <laughs>
corruption of his son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his blessing. Amen. Amen. May God, who through the water of baptism has raised us from sin into newness of life, make you holy and worthy to be united with Christ forever. Amen. Amen. May God, who has brought us out of bondage to sin into true and lasting freedom and the Redeemer, bring you to your eternal inheritance. Amen. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.